who are Christian workers? In one sense, everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will open your word to our hearts and our minds and our hearts and our minds to your word. We pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, who are Christian workers and uh, how should they act and uh, what should they do? Well, Tonight I want us at this commissioning service to address those questions uh, as we think about Paul's words to uh, the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 uh, and verses 1 and 2. And you've got those on the back of uh, your service sheets, uh, but you might like to look at them in the Bible to have that open at page 953, as I'll mention one or two other passages. And uh, you'll see that on the back page of your uh, service sheet. You've got an outline of uh, where we're going and some space to jot a few notes. And you'll see that after some words of introduction, uh, my headings are that a Christian work is first a servant of Christ, secondly a steward, and uh, thirdly is to be a trustworthy steward. So briefly, by way of introduction, who are Christian workers? In one sense, everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. Uh, a classic passage in the New Testament on Christian ministry uh, is Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. That uh, says that Christ has given the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints, that is other Christians, for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Therefore, everyone should have some work of ministry. But uh, this is helped and guided by those appointed uh, for equipping work. And uh, all the work together of whatever kind is so necessary for building up the body of Christ. Uh, for growth, say the next verses in Ephesians 4, is the purpose of this work. Verse 13 says the body of Christ, the church, and its members are to be built up one until we all attain to the unity of the faith. 2, verse 14, that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Uh, 3, verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And 4, verse 16, it's from Christ that the whole body joined and held together when each part is working properly grows so that it builds itself up in love. Well, that's some basic guidance about Christian work and uh, workers and the who of Christian work. But I want us to think for the rest of the time about the how and what of Christian work. Uh, so look at uh, those verses 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians 4. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. And our first heading relates to how the Christian worker should work, because the answer is, as a servant of Christ. Let me start with a little context about this letter to the Corinthians. Paul is unhappy about how the uh, Corinthians uh, are treating, the Christian Corinthians, are treating their leaders, which included Paul along with others like Peter and Apollos. On the one hand, different uh, people were putting different leaders on pedestals and uh, giving them too much honour and attention. On the other hand, there was negative and wrong criticism of uh, leaders going on at the same time. So Paul is saying leaders should not get either too much or too little respect and a claim. Rather, he says, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 4, this is how one should regard us, the leaders, as servants of Christ. 
How the Paul is going to imply that doesn't just relate to these elevated Christians like Paul himself and Peter and Apollos, for, for it relates to everyone, whether in leadership or not, because a few verses later in this chapter, if you look uh, down to uh, verse 16, Paul urges every Christian in Corinth, that's the recipients of uh, this letter, to be imitators of me. That's, this is on page uh, um, 954. Verse 16. So every believer should regard themselves as a servant of Christ. But what does it mean to be a servant of Christ? Well, first of all, it means that you will acknowledge Christ as Lord and Master, and uh, so your position as his servant. You will then trust and obey him as a servant does, a good Lord and Master in ordinary life. To be a Christian means to accept Jesus as Lord. Paul writes, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, sadly, in churches, it's possible to be a Christian uh, in, a Christ, in Christian work and le or leadership even without being a real servant of Christ who confesses him as Lord. It's possible, uh, as it were, to get under the radar I wonder if there's anyone here like that tonight. Well, the Bible's command is to repent and believe. Commissioning service is a great opportunity for doing that. It's so easy. It's simply trusting in the Christ who loves you, who wants the best for you and died for you and for your sins, taking your guilt and punishment on himself. And by faith united with Christ, uh, you receive his Holy Spirit. But all that said, assuming you really are a servant of Christ, being a servant tells you how, at its most basic, you should act as a Christian worker or leader. For the word servant here is different to other words for servant in the New Testament. It uh, probably is best translated underling. The word uh, originally could mean an oarsman or uh, a rower. Uh, and rowing on the lower deck of a Greek trireme, that's an ancient ship, often a warship with three banks of oars either side, must have been a pretty terrible experience. Of course, by the first century AD in Corinth, uh, the word could just have had the meaning of underling. But what it certainly means here is that the Christian worker, as a servant of Christ, should be marked by humility. Uh, the Christian worker should be uh, seen as underlings, uh, an underling and not a lord. For this is to follow Jesus' example. He himself uh, was uh, the great example of humility through voluntarily being an underling. Uh, the early Christians had what may have been an early hymn in Philippians chapter 2 uh, that celebrates Christ's humility. Uh, just to quote one verse, verse 8. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the early Christians would have remembered what Jesus himself had taught uh, of the need to exercise humility. That was a fundamental teaching of Jesus. For example, he said, Luke 14, verse 11, Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So at the start of this new session, uh, our church year, as we face an exciting new future, let's be challenged by the words uh, at the beginning of that hymn-like celebration of Christ's humility in Philippians 2, verses 3, and five, 3 to 5. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit. This is Philippians 2, verses 3 and 5 to 5. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So how is your humility? Nor is humility just to be a theory. It needs to go from the head to the heart. It needs to be translated into reality in the light of the people you know in your group or, or work that you're engaged in. 
Now, of course, humility in leadership does not mean failing to give correction, uh, either of ideas or behaviour, when that's necessary. But, and this is very important, Christ's servant must deliver that correction with God-directed care. Uh, as Paul told Timothy, as a young Christian leader, this is 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 25, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. A servant of Christ is to be humble, and when he or she has to correct anyone, uh, it must be done with gentleness and not brutality. And that is why Jesus said, this is Mark 10, 42 and 43, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And these days you, you do have especially to work at humility, as did the early Christians, for not everything uh, in the ancient, not everyone in the ancient world liked humility. Uh, indeed not. And today it goes against the grain of uh, so much of uh, the modern secular worldview. Because at the heart of humility is the truth of the creaturely status of men and women. But uh, acknowledgement of that creaturely status is systematically being eroded, not least in Western education. And that leads to the ultimate sin. Because a denial of belief in a creator, however he chose to create the world, chose to create the world, is at the heart of uh, humility's opposite, namely pride, the, which is the deadliest of the deadly sins. The sin of pride ultimately is putting yourself in the place of God. And that is why a humble servant of Christ will go against the grain of much in the modern world and uh, this will cause opposition and conflict. But Jesus predicted that in John 15, verse 20, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So every believer should regard themselves as a servant of Christ. However, a servant of Christ is not only to be humble, but uh, to do uh, what uh, the master orders us, we have uh, indicated already. Now that brings us to our second heading, a steward of God. This has to do not with the how of Christian work, but more with the what, what fundamentally you are doing as Christ's servant. Now of course, much of what you do uh, in Christian work is shared with others who are not Christian believers. I mean, making cups of tea or coffee at the back of the church physically is not much different to making tea or coffee in a cafe in Clayton Road. Using a mixing desk or a TV camera in church is not much different to using a mixing desk or a TV camera in a secular audio TV studio. So what distinguishes Christian work? Well, the most distinctive thing is that Christian work ultimately is being directly or indirectly engaged in a particular stewardship. As Paul puts it here, it is being stewards of the mysteries of God. And that begs two questions. What is a steward and two, what are the mysteries of God? Well, first, a steward is basically a trustee of another person's goods and entitled to manage them and dispense them according to the governing trust deed uh, that they have or the master's clear orders. On the one hand, uh, you could or can have grand trustees or stewards like Joseph, uh, we heard in our Old Testament reading before he went to prison, and indeed then uh, in the prison. On the other hand, you uh, could have or can have uh, much lesser trustees or stewards who simply administer or steward, for example, another person's will uh, after their death. So that's a steward. But what is the Christian worker or leader stewarding? Well, answer the mysteries of God. What are these? Well, in the New Testament, a mystery uh, is not some dark or secret ritual. Uh, it is a truth that previously was hidden, but now has been revealed. Uh, the New Testament my mysteries are, as it were, opened up secrets. And the greatest of these is that the Old Testament, uh, together with God's promises, 
uh, and predictions have been fulfilled in Christ. So Christ's coming has brought light where there was darkness or at least shadows before. And the result has been what happens when you have a puzzle or in a magazine or a paper, you just can't do it. Well, you turn the paper upside down and there's the answer and it all is clear. And uh, the truth is revealed. Well, the mysteries of God are the truths of God about himself, humankind and the world, now seen clearly through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And uh, you read about this in the Bible, the Old Testament, to make clear certain realities and problems, and the New Testament to provide the lens through which you now read that Old Testament. So what makes the church distinctive, and what makes all our groups distinctive at the church is the truth of God as the Bible reveals it. And this has been entrusted to us to steward corporately and individually. And we're to maintain it and proclaim it and share it with others uh, at all ages and stages of life. Now, of course, as human beings, we think the whole of life belongs to God as the Bible teaches. So we do other things than just Bible studies and uh, engage in direct evangelism, vital and important and necessary as those are. But all is done with an awareness, as the Bible reveals, of Christ being with us by his Holy Spirit, an awareness that all is under the control of our Father in heaven. And that is why you need to work at your relationship with Jesus Christ through daily prayer and Bible study, uh, as well as meetings like this, uh, uh, together and in groups. And this is more and more important when our stewardship uh, of God's truth is getting harder particularly in today's increasingly secular and uh, multi-faith world. And note, you see, there are some people who rightly see the need for servanthood and humility, but uh, with this sort of pressure going on around us, they wrongly get, uh, as has been put, uh, humility in the wrong place. It was G.K. Chesterton who famous, wo famously warned about this. He said, what we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. Modesty has moved from the organ of ambition. Modesty has settled upon the organ of conviction, where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reverse. But you must be firm regarding your stewardship. If you're a trustee of a will, you can't muck around with it and doubt what it obviously says. I mean, when it says Jack must have the car and Jill must have the house, you can't say, I wonder if I should give Jill the car and Jack the house because that is what some people are wanting. No, you have to say, I'm awfully sorry, but I'm not at liberty to change the will. And that is what has to happen with your stewardship of the mysteries of God. Those fundamental truths and teachings of the Bible, other people may want to change them to be politically correct, but you mustn't change them. You have to say, I'm sorry, I'm not at liberty to do that. And that comes to us, brings us to our third heading. A Christian worker or leader has to be a trustworthy steward. Paul knew there can be untrustworthy stewards working in the church and playing fast and loose with their stewardship. The New Testament is clear that there are false prophets the woman bishop who heads the Episcopal Church of the United States was preaching recently on Paul casting out uh, a spirit from an uh, abused fortune-telling slave girl in Philippi, as you, many of you know, and recorded in Acts chapter 16. She was arguing that Paul was guilty of failing to value diversity and uh, see the slave girl's beautiful difference. And I quote her, Paul is annoyed at the slave girl, perhaps for being put in his place, and he responds by depriving her of her gift of spiritual awareness. Paul can't abide something he won't see as beautiful or holy, so he tries to destroy it. Well, that surely is a, an example of untrustworthy stewardship of God's truth. And that's why we must, while being doubtful about ourselves, have no doubt about the truth and reject such teaching and so such leadership. But you could be untrustworthy, not just by denying the authority of God's word, but by simply failing to study it and remind yourself of it. And simply by ignoring the bits you don't like. Uh, millions are doing that these days with regard to what the Bible teaches about gender, sex and marriage. 
I thank God that at this church, uh, this church was founded uh, over 150 years ago to encourage trustworthy stewardship of God's word. It was founded, as many of you know in the quote, as to be a central point for the maintenance and promulgation of sound scriptural and evangelical truth. So as we look into the future, uh, however much we evolve, and evolve we must, um, as this city and country needs new Christian witness, uh, we must remain trustworthy stewards of God's word and truth, corporately and also individually. Well, I must conclude, and I do so with Jesus' parable on uh, the second coming, but also trustworthy stewardship. You find it in Matthew 24, uh, and verses 44 to 51. And it's a challenge, really, to all of us. Jesus said this. This is Matthew 24, 41 to 51. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant, or steward, whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour when he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites in that place there will be weeping and, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, I thank God for all the faithful and wise servants or stewards in this church and, and all who trust Christ and however falteringly seek to obey Christ can look forward to whatever it means in eternity to be set over all his uh, possessions. So have total confidence in Christ. But as Paul went on to tell these same Corinthians, this is in uh, chapter 10, <coughs> And verse 12, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. But as verse 13 of chapter 10 then goes on to say, for if you are tempted, verse, uh, uh, God is faithful. And then verse 14 says, for if you are tempted, God will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Let's pray. Let's pray silently, shall we, as the Holy Spirit would lead us. Maybe someone needs to pray acknowledging Christ's Lordship for the first time and become his servant. Perhaps other of us need to pray for help regarding humility uh, and in regard to certain people even. Or we need help uh, as we try to be trustworthy stewards when there is so much pressure not to be so and to go with the flow of the world. Moment of silent prayers is appropriate to us individually. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. <laughs> 